Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this inquiry where we are going to, we have two objectives to evaluate the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on micro and small enterprises. According to the 2015 ILO report on small and medium enterprises and employment creation, the following terms are defined as follows, micro enterprises, two to nine employees, small enterprises, 10 to 49 employees, and medium size or large enterprises, 50 or more employees. According to the International Labor Organization, the pandemic is heavily affecting labor markets, economies, and enterprises, including global supply chains leading to widespread business disruptions. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused an unprecedented impact on Latin American and Caribbean labor markets, which have already experienced a sharp increase in unemployment rates. The situation leaves millions of people unemployed and without income, which will generate several social economic challenges, including increased inequality and poverty in the region. So we're looking today at what has happened and we have before us Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, and Ministry of Trade and Industry. So we are commencing this inquiry today, and we are happy to have the representative of those ministries and also members of the listening and viewing audience. And mem you are invited, you are part of this inquiry, and you are invited to post or send your comments via the Parliament's various social media platform, Facebook page, PalView, and the Parliament's YouTube channel and Twitter. I am Hazel thompson Ahi, and I'm chairman of this committee. And I now invite members of the committee to introduce themselves. Marvin Gonzalez. I'm Good morning, Saddam Hussein, member. Good morning, Jansi Lachmidial, member. Good morning, Keith Scotland, member. Good morning, Clarence Rambarat, member. All accounted for? Now, I will ask now the members, officials from the various ministries to introduce themselves. Ministry of Finance. Good morning. I am Yvonne Nimacharan, Acting Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Finance. And with you? And with, and with me is Ms. Enid Zephrin. She's the Director of the Strategic Management and Execution Office in the Ministry of Finance. And Mr. Dexter Jagannath, our Program Manager in the Ministry of Finance. Same unit. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Ministry of the U Development and National Service, please. Officials, introduce yourselves. Good morning. I am Farouk Hussein. I am the Acting Permanent Secretary at the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service, my DNS. Good morning, Chairman and Committee Members. I am Calvin Maurice, Chief Executive Officer of NETCO. Good morning to the Committee. My name is Marlon Mills. District Coordinator of Enterprise Development Division, my DNS, Ministry of Youth Development National Services. Trade and industry, please. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Neville Alexander, Senior Economist at the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Good morning, Chairman and members. Uh, my name is Dan Raj Hari Prasad. General Manager, Client Services at Export ET Limited. 
So welcome, welcome all of you. We're very happy to have you here with us this morning. So again, the objectives to evaluate the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on micro and small enterprises, to identify the factors and conditions which may inhibit business continuity for micro and small enterprises post COVID-19, and to assess the existing policies, projects, and programs of the state designed to support the economic recovery. Now I'll ask each of you, each representative of the ministry, one person, to make your opening remarks, maximum of two minutes. Mr. Hussain, can we start with you, Farouk Hussain? Madam Chair and members of the GSC, the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service appreciates the work of the Joint Select Committee on Finance and Legal Affairs in its inquiry into the impact of COVID-19 on micro and small enterprises. The Ministry recognizes and applauds the tenacity of micro and small enterprises which have been the most vulnerable to the economic challenges owing to COVID-19. As innovators, entrepreneurs, and business owners within the MSE sector are the backbone of emerging economies. In fact, MSEs are integral in our economy's development and diversification. The Ministry of Youth Development and National Service through its agency, the National Entrepreneurship Development Company Limited, NETCO, provides direct support to our MSEs adversely affected by COVID-19. They have made available to MSEs a maximum of 20,000 TT in grant funding via the Entrepreneurial Relief Grant. To date, approximately $30 million and grant funding have been distributed to qualified MSE. The Ministry of Youth Development and National Service commands all our micro and small enterprises in their business endeavors. I thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hussain. Now I invite Ms. Yvonne Nimacharan, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Finance. Good morning, Madam Chairman and members of the Finance and Legal Committee, my colleagues at the Ministry of Finance and the other attendees from ministries and others present in the meeting this morning. Madam Chairman, the Ministry of Finance recognized that the COVID-19 pandemic presented specific challenges to the micro and small enterprise sector. In consideration of the important role this sector plays in the economic development of the country, the Ministry of Finance responded with a comprehensive suite of measures and strategic interventions to address these challenges, details of which were provided in our response to the committee questions. We hope that the information submitted will assist the committee in its deliberations, and also the team present here this morning is also willing to assist the committee in its further deliberations. Thank you. Thank you as well. Mr. Neville Alexander, Senior Economist, Ministry of Trade and Industry. Uh, thank you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning again to the committee members, other distinguished uh, participants, and the listening public. Uh, Madam Chair, the Ministry of Trade and Industry has as its core mandate the development of the non energy sector and it's a responsibility that we have endeavored to pursue in the best of our abilities and with the emergence of the pandemic and the measures we saw the effects that it had on the um, small and micro enterprises and we have endeavored to take measures to continue to support um, those sectors those affected firms as best we could there, we have implemented a number of measures in that regard. 
the Export Booster Initiative being one of them, which is a comprehensive package of initiatives aimed at helping business um, build capacity and uh, do better overall, both in the local market and externally. We also have a number of um, ongoing programs that all combine to help develop the business community and the small businessman. Um, and this work is, is, is led large in large part by Expo TT, our implementing agency. Um, going forward, uh, Madam Chair, we would like to um, thank uh, the committee for the opportunity to speak to these issues and um, provide clarity or further explanation on some of the written responses that we have provided to the committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. So we will commence questioning, and I will um, remind you to direct your question and concerns through the chair. And um, please don't say through the chair because um, we know it's through the chair, yes? And um, so you just ask your questions. And um, then you, we I also would like to remind you to activate the microphone on your devices when you acknowledge and turn it off when making your contribution so we don't have that feedback. So we will proceed, starting with youth and development. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, if I could get started. Yes, so I, um, I recognize you to begin yes. your questioning, it's Member Lachmedia. Yes, good morning, um, members and um, persons appearing before the committee. Uh, firstly, I just want to ask a question with respect to the engagement of persons during the COVID-19 uh, period and the lockdown and your, the ability to engage with um, your stakeholders. You mentioned the ministry's response, um, mentioned utilizing non-traditional methods of communication um, as to get around the imposition and the restrictions on face-to-face -face communication. Uh, Zoom and Teams and so on, uh, and telephone. Could you identify for us uh, whether there were any special um, hotlines, telephone numbers available, as well as um, how this service that was available to your stakeholders, how it was marketed, um, so that people would have been aware that this was available to them during the period? Good morning again. Um, the implementation of um, initiatives with respect to entrepreneurship and especially the, um, the ERG uh, was through our um, agency, NEDCO. Um, so I will ask the CEO of NEDCO to, um, to provide the details, thanks. Thank you very much, PS. NEDCO initiated uh, various means in regards to communication with these stakeholders, one of which would have been a direct hotline so stakeholders can contact NEDCO. Other forms of getting out the information in regards to the hotline and means of communication would have been advertised on the national newspapers and also on NEDCO's Facebook page. We kept constant uh, communication through that, that, those media, and uh, we, uh, uh, that's, that's one of the major ways of engaging these stakeholders. Okay, and um, is that hotline, could you tell us when that hotline was set up, or, or approximately when that hotline came on stream? The hotline came on stream immediately upon the start of this business in January 2020, in July 2020, sorry. And this hotline that you say this boost the hotline was dealing specifically with the entrepreneurial relief grant or just in general um, assistance that, that the ministry could offer to, to SMEs, MSMEs? Well, significantly in regards to the ERG, but of course, other support that would have been required um, from NEDCO in regards to the uh, uh, micro entrepreneurs. Okay. With respect to the, um, the um, virtual meetings that you were able to have with stakeholders. Um, could you tell us about approximately how many um, meetings you were able to have with persons, with clients? 
I'll just refer to them as clients generally. Well, we had a total of 400 training sessions to 143 business advisory sessions and one um, uh, we had just approximately in terms of webinars I don't have the exact number on, on terms of webinars oh sorry sorry the numbers I gave you would have been a number of participants for the various um, I was sessions. wondering yes <laughs> so we had uh, 401 um, persons who participated and in training, business advisory, 143, and webinars, 1,916, making it a grand total of 2,500. I unfortunately do not have the number of sessions, but the total of participants. Mm -hmm. um, before accessing one of the um, services um, or the ERG, particularly would attendance at any particular session be mandatory upon, um, before you are able to access the, the grant? I, I did look at the criteria for the grant, but um, I didn't see, um, sorry, in your submission. It had some basic criteria, but I didn't. Um, you said that you would do a site visit, um, but you didn't say whether or not attending any of these sessions, like inf information sessions. I assume that these sessions would be geared towards it, it the was Yes, it was open. Uh, it was not mandatory. That, it was not mandatory. Uh, no, it was not. Okay. Um, with respect to the site visits, um, do you have any idea how many site visits you all would have done during the period for businesses who wish to access the ERG? Just the amount of disbursement, which have been over 3,000 site visits, all of them virtual, of course. Oh, virtual. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Okay, I don't know if anybody else has questions on that first um, point okay. about stakeholder right. engagement. Thank you what very much. You, sorry, you wish to? Yes, yes, please, Chair. Um, to, to the three entities, this, this question applies to everybody. What I noticed across the three submissions was that um, a significant amount of potential recipients did not meet the um, the criteria, and that 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 specifically relates to things like evidence of incorporation, evidence of registration, financial records, and some of those things. So while the grant was available, it seems as though a lot of potential beneficiaries did not meet some of the things that the, the things required for consideration so I, I want you just to talk about that and also say what efforts are being made to, to assist these um, potential beneficiaries going forward in meeting some of the basic um, the basic statutory requirements if i may uh Netco, one of the requirements would have been registration of business. In starting the application, we accepted a BIR number, but on, upon completion of the um, processing of the grant, the applicant would, be, would have been required to provide Netco with the registered business. So at the end of the day, all 3,000, over the 3,000 persons that would have been uh, beneficiaries to ERG from NETCO eventually were registered as businesses. I know you were directing it to the other sectors, but let's take it in order so that um, when we get to that sector, they can answer that question. But I wanted to ask, before I go to Mr. Hussain, Member Hussain, what are the most common challenges that are confronting these micro and small enterprises sector during the pandemic? Uh, as we had indicated in our submission, uh, the, the contraction in demand for goods and services um, and 
uh, along with that, the reduced income by uh, the enterprises. So they have difficulty in covering the expenses such as rent and wages, et cetera. Um, of course, unreliable supply chains. And as we are aware, um, there are difficulties with respect to access to foreign exchange. So those were the major um, challenges that were identified um, uh, by the ministry as well as by NEDCO. All right, now let me explain to all the entities present that you would have submitted to us um, responses to our questions, which we have in front of us. But this is a public inquiry, and we want the public also to be informed. So you will find that you will be repeating orally at times things that you've already said to us in writing, so that at the end of the day, the public will be well informed as well as we are. So thank you. Member Hussain, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my questions are directed directly to NETCO. Um, can you tell us the date in which these grants became available to individuals? Yes, the grant became available uh, late, I can, the exact date, but it late the last week in July 2020. Last week, July 2020. Um, and of the 3,297 beneficiaries of the grant that you indicated in your response to us, can you let us know or confirm that all 3,297 persons' businesses were registered? Yes, it would, it would have been a prerequisite. So as I indicated earlier, though most, some of them would not have been registered in terms of starting the application. It would not have prohibited the processing of the application. So in terms of uh, evidence required to complete the application, uh, uh, the business would have been required to show evidence of, of, of registration, if only by at least starting the process of getting their, having their business name identified and um, being evidence so from the Ministry of Legal Affairs. Okay. And then afterwards, I saw that, well, I listened to you before and you said there's something called one of the um, checks and balances is that you all, uh, you all conduct a site visit and you said there's a virtual site visit. Can you just give us an indication of what this virtual site visit is about? Well, the virtual site visit will, be, will require to uh, the business owner, the entrepreneur, to provide evidence of what they say the business um, identified what the business was, was about in the application. So if it's a retail store, then they will have to identify the, the signage of the business. They'll have to identify, show you virtually in terms of different areas of, of the store to confirm and to provide enough evidence for NETCO. Obviously, um, member one because of the pandemic netco staff was certainly unable to go out um given the exposure uh we found the virtual arrangement worked quite well and sufficiently so so we can confirm no physical checks were done by netco um the ministry would have released approximately let's say about 28 million dollars and no virtual visits sorry no physical visits were done to over 3,297 beneficiaries of this money. Um, I, I have some, I'm, I'm very uncomfortable with that position because right now we're open on that. Um, I think NETCO should have done some physical visits to really verify some of these applications. Because in the past, we have seen where grants were issued um, previously and there was no um, established entity operating at the sites in which um, the information was given to. So that's the first point. The second point with respect to the, um, the grants is that when you issue this grant to these individuals, is there a follow-up to determine whether or not the monies were spent in accordance to what they indicated 
that they would have spent the money for? Um, can you indicate to us what are the controls or the accounting mechanism for these beneficiaries to NETCO? Well, the premise of the grant uh, member was to recover loss and not to invest in. So the, in terms of evidence required by the applicant to show what they actually did would be limited because the premise of the grant was to recover loss of the business during that specific period of the pandemic. In terms of our accounting procedure and the, the quality of the, our accounting procedure has been subject not only to uh, our internal audit system, also which we provided to the committee in terms of the internal audit report, but also by the Auditor General. I, I, I can't see, I, I maybe missed it, but I didn't see the internal audit report. Um, so basically, the grant was for buffering loss suffered by businesses, but the businesses have no duty to report to NETCO to indicate exactly where the money was spent. Is that what I'm getting from you, Mr. Maurice? Correct. Mr. Maurice, um, sorry, Chair, can I just ask a question? I don't know. I stepped away for a moment, um, but I don't know if it was asked. I just have another question coming out of the parameters for the ERG. Um, the, I, I heard when um, Mr. Maurice indicated about some proof that the registration process had begun. And as an alternative, I see here that proof of an assignment of a BIR number was requested. What about proof of actually filing your tax returns? Did NEDCO ask um, applicants for this grant to show that they had actually been up to date with the payment of their taxes and with their tax returns? Member, no, we did not require, we did not ask of that evidence, uh, that type of evidence. Uh, and essentially, during the period of pandemic, the, the withholding the uh, grant or funding from the entrepreneurs um, based on the arrangement between Ministry of Finance and, and, and Ministry of Youth Development and National Service through the agency of NETCO uh, was not on the premise again on this area in terms of the um, compliance with taxes. It was not part of our remit. Well, you see, Mr. Maurice, the reason I ask that question is that based on the criteria and the parameters you set out here, it appears that $28 million could have been disbursed to people who have don't have a registered business because they've only begun the process, who are doing business based on a virtual site visit, but perhaps have never paid their taxes. And, um, you know, I... I don't know how we confirm proof of address and details on persons employed virtually, but um, I, I share the concern of um, Member Hossein about the criteria here because we have a serious, um, it, it, it's, you know, it's been raised on many places about the payment of taxes as well as the you know, duplication and so on. You said that persons in receipt of other benefits also would not qualify for a right. grant. What sort of verification was done to ensure that no one under this um, who applied for this grant was in receipt of another um, grant? Okay, before I answer that question, may I answer? May I refer to another statement that you made mm -hmm. in terms of proof of? Uh, may may of I interrupt address? here? May I interrupt here? Both questions and responses through the chair, please. So not to you and you. Yes not directly to the person who is asking, but not directly to the person who is responding. Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the proof of evidence would have been through the uh, uh, receipts, uh, for example, uh, electricity bills, uh, and different forms of receipt to show that uh, the applicant 
address would be consistent with what was, was given. As it relates to the, the other part of the question, uh, could you just tell me the other part of the question, please? About, you said that one of the criteria, part of what you stated here, the parameters, you said that you were not in receipt of any other grants. The person, the applicant couldn't be in receipt of grants, okay. food cards, uh, and so on. What type of verification was done to ensure that no one applying for the ERG was in receipt of another type of um, form of government assistance? Well, there was direct synergy between the various ministries or the different uh, disbursing agencies as it relates to grant, and the information would have been shared with NETCO uh, based on the applicants who received grants. So therefore, there was a cross-referencing of that particular mm -hmm. information. Okay, and my final question on yeah, this. Um, yes, final question. Uh, then we go uh, to Mrs. Question. Scotland, please. Sure, final question on these parameters. Um, you said applicants with current or pending criminal court proceedings would not be eligible. Um, I have a bit of a concern there with respect to the, well, current or pending. Um, you know, <laughs> what was the thinking behind excluding persons who may have a, a criminal proceeding pending before the court, regardless of how long? And of course, we know the length of time. I'm sure Mr. Scotland would jump in on that one. Um, but what was the thinking behind excluding someone on that criteria, one? And two, when you say criminal court proceedings, uh, are we dealing with a specific type of proceedings or just anybody? Because, um, you know, some people, for example, might have court proceedings pending for something related to fraud and money laundering and, and, and you know, abuse of, of, of business for laundering money and so on. And you may want to exclude them. But um, I don't know that if you have, for example, a, uh, um, pending charge for, you know, something unrelated to um, fraud or something like that, that you would want to be excluded. So what was the thinking behind this and were there specific parameters relative to this pending criminal court proceedings? Uh, there were not, uh, just to say, member, I, I would not have specific information in regards to the justification behind it. As I said, it was... Uh, a discussion between Ministry of Finance and NEDCO, and we worked within a particular remit. But just to say that uh, no persons in that category came before NEDCO in regards to um, the application. Perhaps because they knew they didn't qualify. We have no so evidence of such persons coming well, through. Well, I, 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 I just wish to place on record my concern that persons who are innocent until proven guilty might have been... Um, excluded from accessing our government's grants. Um, I, I have, uh, well, as members of know, I have serious concerns when it comes to those um, areas. But nevertheless, um, I would appreciate some more information if you could provide it as a with respect to the thinking and whether there were specific parameters to narrow down that um, definition of pending criminal proceedings. Before we go to Mrs. Scotland, I just need to clarify something with you, sir. Now, in... In response to Ms. Lachmedia or another member, you did say that you were not, um, you did not pay site visits, but in your submission to us, we see in Appendix 1 that one of the other the conditions was site visit to confirm the existence of the business and the details will be recorded on NETCO's current site visit form and the visits may be waived um, if the information was already on file. So which, which should we rely on? your oral evidence this morning or your written submission? My oral evidence, uh, Madam Chairperson, uh, stated that we did virtual site visit. Uh, I did not say we did not do any site visits. Uh, we did virtual site visits. Oh, so they were all virtual? Yes, they were. So we had to understand the site visit to confirm the existence using virtual? They were virtual site visits. Amazing. All right. May I have Miss? Can we turn to Mrs. Scotland then? Chairman, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Chairman, before I begin my very brief interrogation, may I disclose that I have in the past, in a non-contentious and maybe a contentious matter, acted on behalf of NETCO. So I've, I've disclosed that as an interest in the past. Um, through you, Madam Chair, May I ask, the 
as it relates to the virtual site visits, Madam Chair, through you, over the past 14 to 18 months, could we confirm, Madam Chair, that the judiciary, before virtual trials commence, do virtual site checks in law offices or the VAC centers to ensure the integrity of the courtroom, so to speak, because there's no physical court. And can I ask through you whether Netco did that same, although it was virtual, whether that same sort of checking for various pointers, the existence of the business, certain things, I don't know, that would have established the legitimacy of the business, but for an actual physical visit? Yes, NECO would have, well, we, based on the virtual side visits, the key uh, landmarks, the key information in regards to the business. So therefore, if a NETCO uh, officer will want to drive past the business, that was also possible. Because what NETCO was attempting to do, members, would have been one, to safeguard our staff from the exposure, but also to execute in, in an exped expeditious way the um, grant application. So correctly so, landmarks would have been taken drive passing by drive passing the business uh, to verify the information and the existence of the business. But it is, I will not say we did it for 3,500 businesses, but essentially it was available as an option, as an audit option for NETCO. Thank you. My second question through you, Madam Chair. It's um, for member who's saying a follow-up question. You've done your audit. Have you unearthed any instance of any fraud perpetrated by any applicant for the emergency grant based on the methodology used by NETCO for the 28 million? No, no, uh, no fraud, no evidence of fraud was identified in our audit. And of course, you know, all audits will show limitations. Um, sometimes the uh, proof of address may not be clear and those are the things. Uh, those, are, those are evidential in terms of an audit, but there was no proof of any fraud in regards to the process being um, done. And Madam Chair, my final question on this issue, I'm piggybacking a little, but I want to be a little more specific than um, Member Rambara. This emergency relief grant represents a substantial investment by the people of Trinidad and Tobago in our small entrepreneurs. Do you have, has NETCO or has the ministry, maybe the PS can answer this, have any continuum of service to follow up with these recipients to ensure because the, the, the pandemic is not going anywhere soon. Do we have any continuum of service that has been established or any plan to establish that in order to continue to assist, if not financially, but in terms of maybe resources, maybe input, business input, these recipients of the grants to make sure that the grants have optimum results? I can answer that. I'm sure the PS would also um, support. The NETCO, we did a survey during the process of the disbursement of the grant. As, of, as a matter of fact, May 2021, to identify what additional needs will be required, exactly what is being asked by member, uh, what additional need needs will be required to support these entrepreneurs. And it would have been identified that training, uh, business advisory, and, and NETCO decided based on the information coming out from that the survey 
provided and continue to provide that measure of support to the clientele in a direct way, one of which would have been the um, digitalization of businesses. We even had a joint uh, uh, arrangement with the Chamber of Commerce in regards to uh, the support of uh, uh, a seminar as it relates to digitalization of for micro-entrepreneurs. So yes, NECO has a system in place to, in, to follow up and to enforce or to support these micro-entrepreneurs in terms of sustainable business activities. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Member Hussain? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Maurice, I just want to get back to some of the questions, some follow-up with respect to some of the responses you have given. You said that the grant, the Entrepreneur Relief Grant, was to buffer those businesses that may have suffered loss. So basically, the grant would have been directed to some of the loss that they would have suffered due to the pandemic. When I look at the documents, and this is a NETCO website I'm reading from, um, required to access the grant I'm seeing for personal documents, ID cards, date certificate, BIR number. For business documents, certificate of registration, proof of business operations, including receipt, invoices, contracts, and proof of address. There is nowhere in those documents to be provided that I'm seeing that you must prove that there was some sort of loss in terms of the business. Um, how were you able to verify that these businesses actually suffered loss who were given the grant? Well, the fact that we asked for the proof of expenditure through the evidence of receipt during the period of the pandemic, and uh, we would know that during the period of pandemic, there was no income. There was no income because of the... Uh, shutdown of the economy, uh, the closure the requirement for these businesses to close because of the pandemic. And they were supposed, they, they were asked, as you quite rightly, correctly, and correctly said, they, was, uh, they provided us with evidence through invoices in terms of money that they would have spent during or before that period of pandemic that incurred loss because there was no income coming uh, during the period of the pandemic. But so this the Mr. reason of the invoice. But Mr. Morris, an invoice cannot prove that a business well, well, suffered. No, sorry. You, sorry, you would agree with that a business can't yes, prove sorry, that. Yes, sorry, invoice, but what type of billing or receipts they would have received during the period to prove as evidence, to have as a proof of evidence in terms of expenditure for their business during that period? You, you see, I, I'm having difficulty because... When I look at some of the businesses that benefited from um, the grant, they would have been such as grocery outlets, um, ICT, uh, plumbing, electrical. Those were never shut down. Those were always deemed as essential businesses throughout the restriction, the pandemic. So you can't say that an invoice can prove loss when in fact some of these businesses were essential businesses. Well, should there be additional information required to support your, uh, if it's insufficient at this time, we net, we can also provide further support in regards and to your question. I have one more question. So, With respect to the requirement for the person not to have a current or pending criminal charge, if you may remember, and I'm, I'm looking at an article here in the news day, dated April 2021, where the police was not able to issue certificates of character, and I would imagine that you would have required a certificate of character. And if none were being issued by the TTPS, how were you able to identify or verify that those persons met the requirement? We can respond um, as uh, uh, in terms of your question with uh, written evidence or written a written response on that matter. Okay. Thank you. Now, Member Gonzalez has been waiting for a while. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, yeah, I eventually put down my hands because the same um, area that MP Scotland or Member Scotland examined and, and um, sought clarification from Mr. Maurice, 
it's the same angle that I was about to take. So I decided to take down my needle. Fair enough. Thank you. Unless there is another burning question for this ministry that we've had on on the spotlight for a while, I would like to move to trade and industry. Yes? And with trade and industry. Remember to forward your questions through the chair and respond through the chair as well. Not in the personal. Well, Chair, I, I, anyone? Well, I, I just I had one other question that we had identified. I don't think it was addressed to the Ministry of Youth, yeah. not the net specifically, but to the Ministry of Youth and National Service. And I think it's important because it comes from their response specifically um, with the Enterprise Development Division um, with respect to the challenges that they have um, with staffing. Um, perhaps I could just... Um, ask if they, if, uh, because we are pressed for time, we spent some time already on this ministry, if they could provide us with details of the staffing needs and the number of vacant positions currently in existence that require filling. Anybody from Ministry of Youth and National Service? Did PS respond? The permanent secretary. Anybody else from that ministry? Maybe we've lost them. Um, perhaps the. Right. Um, yes, I think Good. PS is. Yes, sorry. Good morning, um, again, Chair, and to the committee. Um, Marlon Mills, the district coordinator for enterprise development. Um, Currently, the complement on staff is supposed to be 19 persons approved by the cabinet. If you want, I could call it out by its position, or I could send it in writing for you. Or, um, yeah, give us how many are vacant right now, and you can send the details in writing to save time. Okay, vacant right now, all I have is one district um, coordinator and three clerical staff currently. So That's basically, we're missing nearly all the technical staff. All right. Thank you very much. Ministry of Trade and Industry. Given that the an SME is defined as having one to twenty-five employees and an asset base of up to one point five million, including real estate, and a sales total of below two hundred fifty thousand dollars or five million dollars, can the Ministry of Trade confirm the number of small and micro enterprises that are exporters and the estimated total annual value of export by small and medium enterprises? Small and micro enterprises, sorry. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, the statistics we have with respect to small and uh, micro enterprises um, is uh, centered around the, the number of uh, companies that we engage in in terms of trade. And I, I, ex I believe the figure that um, in terms of established exporters or regular exporters, known to us is in the vicinity of uh, 300 or so. Um, exactly how much of those are uh, classified as small and micro enterprises? I could um, invite um, uh, Mr. Harry Bissar from Export TT, who may have some information to uh, further delineate that. But um, from our perspective, that a uh, figure of 300 or so odd uh, companies, and some of them would include uh, some of the larger ones are uh, known to us. In terms of the export, uh, what I can say is uh, in terms of non-energy exports for which the ministry 
uh, is, 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 is focused of primary its activities on uh, the figures we have in terms of non-energy exports. It's, it's in the deficit vicinity of about $48 uh, million dollars annually. And uh, when we go further, a further breakdown in terms of um, uh, exports from the manufacturing sector, we're looking at between uh, three to four million dollars um, annually in exports. Um, but I can invite uh, Mr. Harry Prasad if he um, would like to further expand on that. Okay, th thank you, Neville. Um, the, just to be clear, the, the exporters that we're speaking about would be merchandise exports, exporters, those who are trading in tangible goods, because that is the data that we have available to us. It would not include services exporters. And um, Neville, you shared a figure there, so it's between around 300 and 400 ex active exporters per year based on the activity on our SEW uh, database, which records these transactions. Um, I would say um, maybe roughly 40% uh, of those would meet, 40 to 50% would meet the requirements of SMEs, um, but more on the micro and small side, because what you will find is of those 400 exporters or so, um, the top 40 are the ones who would be categorized as large doing um, exports of over $4 million. Um, $4 million. Um, and most of the exporters that remain are within that MSME category. I was intrigued in your, when you wrote about Tobago capacity building, and you have a budget of two million hundred of one hundred thousand dollars. Yes, and you're talking about businesses registered in Trinidad and Tobago, but operating in Tobago. And you know, I have a sweet tooth myself. And when you talk about the producer of fudge, tamarind ball, sugar cake, Benny balls, and so on and domestic condiments, beverages, and sauces. And I see it's only for Tobago. And I'm wondering, you know, you're not offering that facility to Trinidadians as well who make their sugar cakes and fudges and so on. Is there a particular reason? Okay, so yeah, the, this uh, project was specifically targeted to those indigenous products in Trinidad and Tobago to leverage uh, its... Uh, it's it, it, it as a tourist destination where persons would have been uh, accustomed to visiting that market and aware of those with those particular products. What we recognize specifically in Tobago is that we had multiple producers of those indigenous products. However, the standards um, were not the same. Uh, most of them lacked certain capacity. So should they get an export order, no one supplier would be able to meet that order. So with respect to this particular project, um, the deals with the indigenous suites, the thinking was to standardize the product, get all these um, manufacturers together, improve the packaging as well so that it becomes more of an exportable product. So there's no more of these clear plastic bags that you see around um, and, and work with them in that regard. Now, whether or not it's not available to Trinidad and Tobago manufacturers yes. of the same, same products, uh, right. This particular project deals specifically with Tobago um, exporters, but mm -hmm. uh, we deal with uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad exporters on a regular basis with respect to these. So we do cover these products, but we just saw that there was some distinct um, challenges experienced with Tobago exporters, particularly with things like logistics, getting raw materials in and out exports out of those markets. And that special um, Type of products, particularly what differentiates from Trinidad and Tobago, from Trinidad to Tobago, like the Ben and Balls and stuff like that. We saw that there were some um, trends towards um, those particular products using sesame seeds as a, a healthier option that we thought that we could focus on and ensure that Tobago has that support with respect to this project. What I should add is that the indigenous suites is just one facet of that 2.1 million. There are other activities that are happening there as well which include um, getting 10, export, 10 potential exporters from Tobago manufacturers onto an e-commerce platform that, so that would allow them to be able to sell their products abroad. 
And there's also some work being done in collaboration with EID Cut towards building out a, a factory shell to uh, accommodate some of our exporters, some of our manufacturers in Tobago operating out of their kitchens so that they will be able to meet certain import requirements and uh, productive capacity that will be required for sales uh, both domestically and externally. Have you been um, looking? Uh, All right. Sorry, Have Madam you... Chair. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, just to correct my, myself um, for the record, in terms of the non-energy exporters, it was billion. I, I think I mentioned million. So it's 40 billion and 4 billion for the manufacturing sector. Sorry. All right. Senate, uh, Minister, Mi Member Hossein. I see your hand is up. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so based on the Ministry of Trade and Industries um, written response that you would have provided to the committee, I just want to focus um, with respect to what was taking place at the port and the operations of the port, um, because that was one of the challenges to some of the small and micro enterprises in Trinidad and Tobago with respect to the, um, to the freight cost. And, because I think um, pre-pandemic um, freight cost was about 2,500 US for a container and it just went up to about $15,000 US. Um, at the end of the day, that cost would have translated to the customer. And then there were also issues with respect to the delays at the port, um, which would have incurred additional fees to the, um, the importers. Can you indicate whether or not the ministry um, if, there, if this is a concern to the ministry and what relief um, was given to some of the importers so that they can continue to manage the business during the pandemic while keeping um, the cost of goods and services down um, to the consumer. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Which we, we are the ministry. We are well aware of the issues um, that... Uh, uh, arose with the pandemic and with the court. And um, there were some um, issues in particular that came came to us um, that a lot of business um, men would have uh, expressed in terms of um, delays, um, rising uh, charges as well. Uh, so to address those, one of the things the, the ministry did uh, pretty early um, after the lockdown measures were implemented was to uh, engage the business community to canvas um, from them the issues that they were facing and to explain to us exactly um, how we could intervene. Um, we had discussions with the supermarket association, uh, some of the pharmaceutical suppliers, as well as the other business support organizations such as the TTME and so on. And from those discussions, we were able to, first of all, take a stock taking exercises in terms of ensuring that food supplies and, and medicines were um, available and to identify or for, um, predict or as, as best we could what were some of the bottlenecks that, we, uh, that may occur and try to put measures in place to address those. So the ministry would have intervened uh, in some cases with the port um, where there were delays to um, uh, for shipment and where costs would would have been incurred um, in terms of food food items and other um, sensitive items, we would have intervened to ensure that those log jams were uh, cleared uh, with the port to help um, alleviate some of those issues. So um, that was some of the immediate uh, reactions that done and interventions that would have been taken um, for uh, more medium to long term um, solutions, we are looking at a number of initiatives to try and ease the pressure of the rise in food prices in particular to um, that, that is being um, seen as a result of the global uh, logistics issues um, um, and supply chain issues. So one of the things that we are looking at is we have identified about a, a list of about 20 food items, basic food items for which we are seeking to um, reduce the, the CET duties on to help um, have some uh, reduction in food prices. Um, 
that's an initiative that we are pursuing right now. And um, also, in addition to that, uh, we have um, started work on uh, a list of products that we would like to increase local production of via import substitution uh, program. Uh, these products are those that we think we have the capability locally to produce to such an extent that um, we could eventually be able to supply the region, 75% um, uh, of the region's needs. And for those products that we think we have the capability to do so, we will be seeking to provide some protection via the, uh, the, the CET rate arrangements where we would offer some protection from imports to help build that capacity and be able to reduce that uh, impact on what has happened internationally with food prices and commodity prices um, to, to insulate uh, consumers in that regard so that those products would be available and produced locally. Um, we are also, um, uh, uh, in terms of the port, we are working with the Customs and uh, Excise Division as well as the Ministry of Works and Transport to introduce a system, uh, uh, online software solution to reduce um, the some of the manual processes and streamline the whole process um, to make uh, dealing with the port a more streamlined and uh, efficient system to reduce bottlenecks, uh, take out some of the manual steps involved. Um, that work is ongoing. Right now, we're engaging a consultant to provide uh, those services. Uh, we are looking to complete those negotiations with that um, supplier and start the uh, work for implementing that system early next year, as far early as February next year, once all the negotiations are completed. Um, so, Madam Chair, in addition to that, we had um, one of the things that came out of the discussions with uh, the business community early on um, during the, 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 the pandemic um, led to uh, a number of recommendations on how to move forward. And those recommendations uh, were represented by the Ministry of Trade and Industry on the Roadmap to Recovery team and, and those discussions. And coming out of that, um, one of the recommendations was to make um, the availability of um, our access to foreign exchange uh, more readily available. So through Exim Bank, representation was made um, to have uh, uh, increased access to foreign exchange made available um, through Exim Bank for manufacturers for purchase of raw materials and as well as to conduct other types of um, trade related businesses. Um, so, Chair, we, uh, those were some of the um, things that um, the Ministry took both immediately and things that are, are in train to help um, address and alleviate some of the effects of the, the, the pandemic on the, the micro and small enterprises sector. Ms. Alexander, I thank you very much for that comprehensive. Uh, sorry, Chair, can, can I go no, ahead? No. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive um, answer, Mr. Alexander. Um, I just wanted to know if you would have looked at our neighbor, um, what they have done. And in terms of the neighbor, I refer to Guyana. Um, what Guyana did was that they had instructed that freight charges be reduced to pre-pandemic levels in the calculation of custom duties, excise taxes, and, um, and VAT on the goods that were imported. So the pre-pandemic rate would have been much lower to what the businesses had to pay during the pandemic. So that means shipping cost, freight costs would have increased exponentially. So that is an additional cost to the businesses because we're looking at the, the businesses themselves here. And then they would have to pay taxes based on that increased um, shipping and freight charge. What Guyana did is that they um, reverted to calculating the taxes based on the pre-pandemic charges which meant that there would have been lower taxes that would have been that the businesses would have to pay um, to uh, at the port. Can you indicate or can you say whether or not you had looked at this model to pre to, to 
give some additional relief to those businesses because what Ghana did, it was not permanent decision. They started it, I believe, on the invoices from the 1st of August 2021, and it will run until the 31st of January 2022. And I think that can actually bring some benefit to some of these small and micro enterprises. Um, your views on this? Uh, thank you, Member. Through you, Madam Chair, um, Guyana's um, uh, approach is, is, is uh, surely an interesting one on one that uh, we can look uh, to for an example as a, a potential solution. However, when, when um, the Ministry first um, engaged in uh, its response to the COVID, uh, the response was focused based on the unique situation facing uh, the market and uh, finding the, the particular solution to that particular issue. Uh, that solution, as, as you outlined, that Guyana pursued um, is one that did not arise at the time. Um, however, it is one that maybe could um, warrant further discussion, certainly with um, the Ministry of Finance. Um, it is something that um, trade um, those 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 issues with tax rates and so on is, is, is something that finance will certainly be a big part of the trade. Certainly could um, give some um, input into the effectiveness of it and whether or not it's a as a road or option we we'll want to employ. So I thank thank you, um, committee member, for um, for raising it. Um, so something we will look at in the future. I thought I thought that your export booster initiatives, you know, very. You have a lot of plans and um, very impressive, but what you fell short as far as I'm concerned is the timelines, because we want the pandemic was over, you know, we don't want to reach a stage where two years down the line, we're still thinking about those very, very important plans that you put on the table. So that um, this, I don't want to call it a shopping list, but it is certainly shows that some thought went into it. But you know, we concerned about the actions after the thought. So that when you talk about um, the budget allocation of $3 million identified to establish a trade facilitation office in Panama and Dominican Republic, and you're talking about 100 firms, have they been identified? And what is the estimated time frame for establishing the trade offices in Panama and the Dominican Republic? And time frames would have been useful for a lot of the plans that you have you know, put forward for us to look at. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And yes, um, and, and maybe in our written submission, uh, it was not as clear as it should have been. Um, the timeline for the entire EBI project was a very short one. It, uh, it's a 12-month program, actually. So all those activities that were listed, uh, the intention was to um, start and complete, or, 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 or well, not necessarily complete, but start and execute to the extent that we obtain results within a 12-month period. Um, the end target being um, in, in, in the first year of the program to to increase exports by at least 10% from our 2019 rate and to continue the work of the, this EBI program further um, where we can be able to double exports um, by 2024. So um, I, I think the point that yes, um, immediate results is needed and the intention has always been to obtain those immediate results with some of the programs. Um, the, we have been having some success in um, a, a lot of the initiatives. Some we are um, about to comment recently. Um, if I could focus a little bit on the trade facilitation office and the trade attaches, um, that, that, that activity is one that where we have um, completed a lot of work in the establishment of that. We are based, basing our establishment of that TFO on an existing arrangement where we have a lot of experience with the trade facilitation office in Cuba. So a lot of, um, there, there wouldn't be much reinvention of the wheel, so to speak. So we are able, we will be able to um, get those arrangements running uh, pretty quickly. Um, the timeline for that has um, been uh, delayed a, a bit. Um, 
because of another initiative, um, another related initiative where um, there's consideration for the establishment of a, a trade and um, investment promotion agency, uh, which would have some impact on the old uh, trade promotion initiative of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, the establishment of this trade and investment promotion agency is, is currently being um, before the, the, the cabinet and a special committee of cabinet and um, the outcome of which uh, we are kind of awaiting to be able to get our uh, direction and as to how we proceed but we are in a position to execute once um, a final decision is taken. So for that one, I can um, offer uh, that as one of the re reasons why we kind of delayed it. For the other projects, uh, the Ministry and Export TT is working hand in hand along with the TTME to execute as much as, as quickly as possible many of the projects um, that we have listed. We have uh, um, an, a steering committee that meets uh, every month um, to monitor progress and to um, um, look at project proposals to get it up and running and, and identify um, uh, jam log jams and remove orders and so on. So there is a, a, a energy within uh, the ministry and expertise and those all those involved to push the EBI as quickly as possible, um, keeping in mind the need for quick turnaround and results. Well, I thought, you know, the energy was moving along quite well, you know, because I, I had occasion to find out about the South South Initiative. Uh, and uh, I realized a lot of work was going on here. But when you read here, it sounds as though things are, you know, now starting because it, it now going to establish in Panama and Dominican Republic, you're going to establish this and things, it, a lot of futuristic things. When I know that um, a lot of, of trade is going on, with, with the South already. So you know, confuse me a little, huh? Eh? Uh, Ma'am, should I ask um, another question with respect to this uh, trade promotion, export promotion initiatives, please? Um, specifically, I want to ask about the virtual trade missions. Now, of course, this inquiry is really about um, the MSME sector. So I just wanted to find out with respect to these virtual trade missions and the expectation, or well, I think you all have identified about 120 firms. Are you specifically um, focusing or giving any consideration to firms within that MSME sector? Um, I know you said they must have export capacity. That's one of the criteria included in your table. But are you um, offering any assistance specifically and trying to include or making any special effort to include the MSME businesses in, in this 120 um, firms that could benefit from these virtual trade missions? Um, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll invite um, Mr. Harapisa from ExpoTT to respond. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Neville. So we would treat um, each um, market in a particular way. So we do have the Carico market that is our largest um, market for our exporters as well as the US, um, and there are also extra regional markets that might be a bit more difficult to navigate. So we find that a good entry point for some of these smaller exporters or, or manufacturers now getting into exports would be those CARICOM markets. And thus far, we've had um, virtual missions conducted in both uh, Jamaica and Guyana that would have allowed them the opportunity to meet with potential buyers and determine if business could be done. If we're doing... Um, a more sophisticated market that requires higher import requirements. Like say the US, if you're exporting food and beverage products to the US, you would might require uh, the to be compliant with the Food Safety Modernization Act, which requires HACCP, and it's much more expensive to attain those things, may require infrastructure changes, which we do offer support to, but it may not be the first uh, port of call for a manufacturer, depending on what you're producing as well, because we have seen instances where you have born global companies who are able to uh, manufacture niche items and sum out the necessary import requirements and get their products into market. Uh, that being said, in virtual trade missions, we try to always put forward our best companies, those who are export ready, because at that point in time in the business to business meeting, you have a buyer who's interested in buying from you. So if they say, okay, I need 
two or three containers next month, uh, those companies who are attending the meeting need to be in a, a position to say, okay, I can deliver. And, you know, some of our SMEs, that is not possible. Um, there are possibilities in terms of meeting with distributors of multiple products um, to negotiate the consolidation of a shipment. Um, so many of the smaller companies are able to put together a container and ship that across. And we have an excellent example of that recently where we worked um, with one of our local companies who has, uh, not local companies, a distributor, Chinese distributor from Trinidad and Tobago, the first Caribbean marketing company limited, um, who was able to negotiate an order for um, six or seven of our manufacturers to Shanghai, China, a buyer across there. So those possibilities do exist. Um, however, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So what I'm getting from you is that it's basically just easier Please, to start with um, the Mr. Hossein had his hand up for a while now, so I'd like to recognize him. Uh, if, if I may, Madam Chair, uh, if Ms. Lachmidial has a follow-up to her last question, I could allow her and then I can start my round of questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, could you just tell us, because you said it's basically easier for the, um, the MSMEs to, to be marketed through the... Um, CARICOM region because yes. of the export requirements. Could you yes. tell me um, in terms of the virtual trade missions um, that you've had in the CARICOM region, how many MSMEs would have participated in these or benefited from these virtual trade missions? Okay, so I could tell you how many companies um, I would have to probably submit and write in how many of those would have been uh, MSMEs. Okay, so with respect to Jamaica, um, that was I think uh, 19 companies would have, been, would have part, participated in that. And in Guyana, a similar amount, I think 19, 20 uh, companies would have participated. And I can submit yes, in writing you, the competition. Of it. Yes, if you could break it down for us and just tell us in writing how many were actually sure. falling within the category of businesses that we are examining here, the MSME sector. Sure, no problem. Thank you, Madam. So and then Member Scotland. Thank you. Um, Mr. Um, Alexander, I just want to find out from you, um, basically, the issue regarding Forex, because I said that you said that there has been an increased allocation of Forex to the Exim Bank. <laughs> now, there's still some concern with um, the business community with accessing Forex. Um, there was one membership um, shopping, a large membership shopping um, company, um, which indicated that they were having difficulty. And that was during the pandemic. Um, I think it was in April or so that they were having difficulties with accessing Forex, which means that they could not have um, purchased the, the, the merchandise they would have ordinarily purchased. Therefore, there's a lack in terms of sales from their, um, their company. Um, we had several other persons in the public complaining of the difficulty it is to access Forex. Um, in particular, I saw one, um, one article from the Trinidad Express where a businessman, I believe, is saying that the local shipping and airline agents are refusing TT currency on freight charges and the freight charges must be paid in the U.S. And if they don't raise the U.S., then they would now have to pay um, additional charges until their shipment is cleared. Um, can you confirm if that position is in fact accurate face? And secondly, um, can you indicate how, for example, um, the Exim Bank is allocating the, for, the Forex US dollars? Because there has been, um, there have been concerns that there may not have been an equitable distribution of Forex in terms of the private sector. Uh, thank you, Member. Um, um, Madam Chair, with respect to the, the first part of the question, um, I, I cannot, um, I'm not in a position to verify in terms of the, the, the payment in TT dollars or so. I, I, I won't offer to um, say definitively one way or the other if that is the case. Uh, what I could speak to with respect to the um, allocation of foreign exchange and uh, with, uh, and how it's done by Exim Bank, from what we understand, 
Madam Chair, is that there are basically two categories of um, recipients that the foreign, the additional foreign exchange is targeted to. Um, one being manufacturers, um, and this is for the purchase of raw materials and so on. Um, the understanding being um, that the manufacturing sector uh, is a plays a critical role in the economy and in terms of uh, wealth generation uh, for exchange generation themselves. Um, the the foreign exchange is needed for manufacture of goods and for exports. So um, the allocation would be directed to them in the first instance. Um, in the second instance, uh, Madam Chair, uh, the allocation is targeted or focused towards um, uh, uh, companies um, pro in providing food and pharmaceuticals, um, those as well being critical um, areas in the economy um, that we would not want to have major disruptions in. So the, it's a very deliberate allocation arrangement, Madam Chair, for critical sectors. Um, not all business activities would um, qualify based on that arrangement. So this may account for some of the uh, discrepancies that is, is being noticed, um, Madam Chair. Um, and in terms of the allocation, so there, so if I'm if I'm to be get this correct, the the there will be an allocation of forex to the Exim Bank and there will also be allocation separately to the commercial banks where their customers will be able to um, access the Forex? Uh, th those arrangements to the commercial banks, I think um, Ministry of Finance may be best able to uh, explain those. Okay. But so, from okay. trade's I perspective, we focus on those with the Exim Bank or trade matters. Yes. Okay, well, when we get to Ministry of Finance, I will then raise those issues. Member Scotland, are you there? Before you? Yes, yes, Madam Chair, I am there. Please don't move on, please. Um, Madam Chair, I am at page 10 of the submissions under um, rubric number three, Ministry of Trade and Industries Responses. Madam Chair, through you, I have seen here that it was answered in the affirmative that the ministry is adopting initiatives aimed at developing assist and assisting micro and small enterprises in penetration of overseas markets. Mm -hmm. But Madam Chair, you would appreciate that the penetration of certain key markets will generate foreign exchange, which everyone seems to think is in demand. What I want to know is, what is the focus from the ministry on assisting the MSEs in targeting specifically markets that will enable these SMEs to penetrate those markets in the much needed Forex instead of depending on getting Forex in order to create the business? Madam Chair, that was clumsily put, but I know you can distill that in 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 a way that is on. Or it, has my question been understood? Sure, that they've understood you, and we respond. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. I, I I think I um I, I get the gist of, of what the committee member is is asking, um, and I. To, to, to reiterate, I think the question is um, how do we target the markets um, um, to help the SMEs in particular? And um, what I can see, and I will invite to, no, but more, no, but more importantly, to generate. To so generate for the changes. So instead of they're relying on the Exim Bank and say we need, we need, they're generating that. So they have their own money, they have their own foreign exchange, which their businesses have generated so they can themselves be self-sufficient in foreign exchange by business yes yes and um thanks for the clarification yes we, we the, the, there's a whole suite of activities um, all aimed and targeted at helping embassies and, and local businesses to export um 
export accelerators, which will be targeting new people who, who have maybe exported much before, but we want to get them to export. And, and when we say export, we understood that to mean um, foreign exchange learning as well. Um, and we have a whole list of things, uh, including um, helping them with market research and so on. Um, but I'll, I'll let Mr. Harry Prasad expand on that. Um, he works directly on, on those matters. So, uh, Mr. Harry Prasad. Yep. Thanks, Neville. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's an equation here with respect to the Forex because we do have to purchase inputs for a lot of what we manufacture to ship out. So, and then it depends on the, mo the business model of companies. A lot of our exporters, they also sell domestically as well. So, I mean, that has to be worked out because you're buying raw materials for both domestic sales and exports, but you're paying the US dollars going out and then you're earning a fraction of it um, in terms of the export that you sell. Yeah. So I think, yeah. So that, that is a, a, a key um, um, thing that, that, that needs to be looked at with respect to the business model. Because if we look at markets, going out we could identify the best markets for products the data is out there you can see what is growing in demand um, for different products we could look um, inside the market to determine how competitive we are in terms of pricing um, who the distributors are and line you up but if part of your business model is that local sales are important to you and exports may not be um, as these des are desirable in certain markets where there are opportunities because there are certain investments involved i mean We've had certain circumstances where um, a company may have preferred to expand operations domestically because the cost of the investment um, to get and meet certain import requirements were, you know, too high, um, given all the support that Export TT and the Ministry of Trade provides. So I think that is the key um, question in mind. I think our role as Export TT and the Ministry of Trade is to show um, the importance of um, export markets and the earning potential of it because in some cases you are offered a much higher price depending on the type of your product um, some of our products like a, a beer here is just a beer somewhere outside it's it's, it's a caribbean beer it fetches a premium price and there's someone that would pay more for it chocolate is another example um, we have high quality chocolate util used, utilizing trinitario beans you sell it in Trinidad, you get a price, a fraction of what you could get if you sell it in a European market. So, M Madam Chair, so it leads to my, maybe Madam Chair, this question ought to be answered in writing because this could present a template for our SMEs to launch themselves or focus more on enterprise that will enable them to earn more foreign exchange and thereby not depend on our forex. So maybe, Madam Chair, through you, I can ask for that in writing, and Madam Chair, through this committee, we can divulge that out to the SMEs because that's very important, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, may I suggest this, please? Yes. That's my So first. that we can... You have something else? No, when you're finished, Chair, I will go to my second. Sorry. All right. So that I would encourage the production of the information to be sent to us in writing. And you have I another. have not. Yes, please, yes. Madam Chair. I have looked at the submission. I am not seeing the focus on demographics. Has the ministry given any consideration of specifically targeting young people and people now coming out of the universities to gear them towards more business enterprises instead of working for somebody, working for themselves and encouraging that sort of small and medium enterprises as it relates to young people who have the whole world ahead of them, but taking a chance and going into business. Um, Madam Chair, um, thanks again for that question. And uh, yes, the issue of um, focusing on specific uh, communities, categories of nationals, and getting them more involved in business and trade has been uh, considered by the Ministry of Trade and Industry. 
Um, one of the first things that I can point to you that demonstrated this is um, we recently completed a new trade uh, policy and strategy, um, which for the first time in any trade policy in Trinidad and Tobago's history, um, identified and made policy recommendations targeting uh, women, uh, the youth, and disabled persons, um, and to get them involved in trade and business. Um, we have in that policy um, indicated the intentions there and some of the ways in which we would be seeking to help promote um, those uh, uh, those categories of persons more. Um, in addition to that, uh, Madam Chair, Trinidad uh, and Tobago also recently joined on to the uh, the She Trades Initiative, which was uh, put on by the International Trade Center coming out of Geneva, uh, which in, in summary seeks to increase the participation of women in trade and business um, um, by providing support and training and um, coaching, business coaching to those categories of persons. Trinidad and Tobago is part of that initiative. Um, we have already commenced a number of uh, webinars and training sessions for um, um, uh, individuals. I think I provided in the written submission um, some numbers to that effect. Um, we also have, Madam Chair, um, as part of, as a member of the Caribbean Export Development Agency, Trinidad and Tobago has benefited from uh, a youth program, a youth accelerator program um, that was put on by AICA in collaboration with CEDA. Um, and this, 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 this program uh, uh, aimed at developing the export capacities and competitiveness of the, the youth. Um, two, two companies from Trinidad and Tobago participated in that initiative as well. And, and we imagine and anticipate that um, uh, the program would continue and we would seek to encourage uh, greater participation from our, uh, our citizens and, and those initiatives. So um, those were some of the things um, in response to that initiative, Madam Chair, that we would like to uh, highlight to the committee. Okay, before we go on to the Ministry of Finance, <clears throat> I just wanted to refer you to your response where you stated with respect to the direct assistance grant scheme, a total of 14 firms on Trinidad and Tobago representing the ICT, manufacturing, agro-processing, food and beverage, financial services, energy, and the culture and creative industry sectors were awarded grants totaling, and you gave the total there. But we do have a breakdown. I'm not asking for you, asking you for it now but we don't have a breakdown of how much was given to the various um, entities and like, for example, culture and creative industries. And you would have read, I'm sure in the press about Rodi's success. And many in years past, I know Oliver used to come in from Jamaica and make quite a bit of money. And I've been hearing about a revitalization or revival of turn of the time, but there's a lot of money to be made because of um, through our creativity, we can generate our own sitcoms here and export that and, and actually bring in foreign exchange. So uh, what are you doing really to in, encourage people in culture and creative industries who are extremely creative and, and can um, make programs even better than those that we pay millions of dollars to bring in to Trinidad and Tobago when we can do it ourselves? Any thought, any serious thought being given to encourage people who are creative in that way so that they can generate these kinds of programs and export them? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, yes, the creative industries is a sector that we have identified as one with great potential for the country um, for the reasons that some of the reasons we have outlined the creativity of our peoples. Um, we, we have established a, a company, uh, Creative TT, which has been given a mandate to develop the creative industries. And so they have developed a program of work to help um, 
explore, identify, and explore the opportunities there. Um, three of the sectors that are in focus right now, we're looking at uh, the film sec subsector, fashion, and uh, uh, music um, as some of the three of the key areas that the ministry is looking at. Um, in terms of film, uh, there, there are a number of incentives in place to encourage um, increased production of um, 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 movies and films in Trinidad and Tobago. So th there's a, a, a program of work available to help develop uh, those creative in um, industries. Um, in addition to that, the ministry is working with uh, within the Caribbean region to develop a, a regional uh, services uh, policy, development policy, and one of the subsectors and it, um, so the subsectors that have been identified as the creative. Um, so where there is uh, clear uh, activities to help grow the sector and be doing it at a regional basis as well, in addition to the work that the ministry is doing uh, nationally. So in, in summary, Madam Chair, I, I could speak to those things, but I could surely provide greater detail on what we're doing with the creative industries to the community. I'm very, very happy to hear that. There's hope. Member Lachminial and Member Hussain, and then we go to Ministry of Finance. So try and keep your questions short and your answers short as well. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the Ministry identified in its response um, an allocation for building capacity in the form of um, innovation vouchers, because of course, innovation um, is a big part of being export ready. Um, but what, I'm looking at the criteria for persons and companies to qualify for these vouchers, and you have to show your export potential of the innovation. Um, I'm just curious, in the experience so far, how many of the MSMEs have actually been able to benefit from this um, uh, innovation voucher program? And, um, you know, if in your view, in the ministry's view or export city's view, um, whether or not, you know, the firms belonging to the MSME sector um, really have the ability to show um, strong export potential without being able to access uh, facilities such as this innovation voucher facility, which is a uh, credit, because it seems to be like a little bit of a, a chicken and egg argument. You have to show potential but you can't really potential. You have to show potential to get access to the to the line of credit. But you don't actually. You can't show that potential unless you have access to a line of credit. If you understand what I mean. So if you could just give us some more information about that, and what we want to uh, find out really is whether or not this is feasible for the MSME sector specifically. Yeah, th thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, I will. I will just um, give a. a, a a brief response and, and, and probably invite Ms. Arbisat to, um, to add. Uh, the, the intention of the innovation voucher really is to really um, get companies just on the edge of um, going at a higher level to help them push forward. And uh, uh, they may have a product that is quite um, successfully locally or um, has the potential for greater success. And this initiative is really to help provide um, the assistance they need to do the kind of research on ideas for their product to get them where they need to go. Um, it, it's at a very early stage. Um, so um, there isn't in terms of involvement, but I'll, I'll let Mr. Harry Prasad expand um, on, on the program. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Neville. Um, with this program, we are also trying to get um, our universities more involved as well. A lot of money is pumped into universities um, with respect to like our students and building up those skill sets and knowledge base. So we see the innovation voucher as being an, an, a way into access in these universities, given well, identify, identifying certain challenges that our manufacturing sector, small companies might be experiencing and allow them to have to engage universities and their various departments and expertise to solve those problems, whether it be in terms of their manufacturing processes or development of new products. So we have been engaging with the UE Ventures, who is 
an entity that was developed is headed by uh, Professor Jerry Brooks. And Professor Brooks and his team are more or less that sort of um, access point to all things that are offered by University of the West Indies, West Indies with respect to all their departments and expertise. So um, we are looking, as Neville said, it's in the development stage with respect to how this thing works. But we want to be able to put our manufacturers um, in contact with our universities so that they can access these solutions, but at the same time, build up the capacity of our students to develop these solutions. And um, we have found through um, our research that these solutions can actually be products in their own right that then could be commercialized as well. So those are the potential synergies and, and the possibilities that we believe um, can be had with respect to the innovation vouchers. A lot of it was borrowed with what was existing. Uh, we've looked to organizations like Enterprise Ireland who have already uh, implemented such innovation vouchers with, with success. Um, if I may, if I may. Thank you uh, very much. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, if I may just come in. Um, yes. Provide a little uh, more context um, in response to the committee's the members' um, question. Um, to be clear, um, the innovation voucher program is part of the EBI, and which has um, a very aggressive export um, um, intention behind. Um, we want companies really to be able to, after receiving all the different types of um, support that is provided there to export and so um, when we are looking at companies to work with under the EBI including for the innovation voucher we would want uh, companies where we have something to work with um, something that we see there's this potential to move forward so we would ask or it would focus on a certain type of uh, um, company for those companies with, with potential at a different stage in the spectrum where they may be uh, coming from a new business entity and at one end and at the uh, exporting company at the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have companies somewhere in between. Um, for those companies that are more uh, leaning towards the beginning stage, there are other programs that would provide them that type of support um, in terms of innovating certain products. But for the EBI, because we are so aggressive um, you know, with the exports, we would look for certain things from the company to work with them. Um, and so this is why the, the criteria may, may look as how it, it, it is uh, appears. So just to provide some context as to why it is, uh, how it is. Thank you all. Now maybe go to the Ministry of Finance. Uh, Madam Chair, just one. Um, I know you had acknowledged me previously for the Ministry of Trade. If I may crave your indulgence. Very well, member Hussain. Two very short questions. And one has to do in particular a uh, concern that you have raised with respect to culture. If you and skip the preliminaries and just go straight into the question. Sure. Um, in terms of the cultural aspect, there's one of the world, there's a, it's probably the, one of the um, biggest events in the world, which was the Dubai Expo um, 2021, where countries were given the opportunity to have pavilions um, to showcase the talents and the, the, the sectors of their country. Can you indicate whether or not Trinidad and Tobago participated in the Dubai Expo 2021? Um, I'll, I'll invite Mr. Harpisan. Okay. Yes, we are participating at the Dubai Expo. We do have a pavilion there. Um, and that expo runs from October to March, um, on March 11th. We have our national day, where, which features a cultural performance and a parade, uh, which we're currently um, um, uh, developing to ensure that we have a good showing for that particular event. Okay. Um, yeah. And the second very short question, maybe this can be provided in writing. Um, at page 22 of your response, you indicated the launch of the $500 million agriculture stimulus package. Um, can you just give us in writing a breakdown of how many of the farmers would have accessed this particular $500 million grant, um, grant um, how many accessed it, how many applications are still pending, 
um, and how many were denied and some of the reasons why they may not have been able to access the um, the funding so that as a committee we could make recommendations. Thank you. If um, yes, if it's not under your portfolio, you can just say that. Yes, I was about to say that um, um, it's, it's really under the Ministry of Agriculture. Um, we provided that uh, information in response to the committee to give a holistic picture of, of what was being done. Um, but it's really a matter of, uh, I, I think, best place with the Ministry of Agriculture. Okay, the only reason I raised it is because it was under written response. Thank you. Let's move to Ministry of Finance. Thank you very, very much, Ministry of Trade and Industry. We've worked you very, very hard. And he nods in agreement. Mr. Alexander, thank you. So let's begin our question with Ministry of Finance. Without you, there can be nothing. So we we haven't left you for last because you are the least important, but because you are the most important. You hold the purse string. So let's hear from Ministry of Finance. Begin the questioning, please. Who goes first? Madam Chair, may I? Um, I just want to ask the representative of the um, Ministry of Finance if they can give us a clear indication or an idea as to the challenges that the credit union um, movement faced in disbursing grants to, to businesses that have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic because from the preliminary information we have, is that the, um, the sum of money that was made available to the credit union movement to offer support to their members. Um, th there wasn't the level of uptake um, from the members um, with respect to their respective credit unions. And I was just wondering whether or not the Ministry of Finance can give us an idea as to what are the challenges faced by the credit union movement in giving the, the support to their members. Madam Chair, thanks for the question. But um, at this time, we would want to provide that particular response and write them to the committee. Very well, and as soon as possible, please. Yes, Madam Chair. And perhaps you can tell us the factors which are inhibiting business continuity for the micro and small enterprises? Thank you again, Madam Chair, for the question. And I'll ask the, um, our director to answer that one, Ms. Zephyrin. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. One of the relief measures offered by the government to assist the SME during the COVID um, pandemic was the small SME loan guarantee program. That program was conceptualized sometime in May of, March of 2020 and was approved by the government to be rolled out via the commercial banks and by extension to be administered by an administrative agent at True Citizens Bank. To date, we have 272 of those banks accepting the facility, 272 SME, sorry, accepting the facility, and we do have quite a number, about 230, who are unsuccessful. It means, therefore, that there were some challenges that were obvious and probably overwhelming. So some of those challenges were the inability of the borrowers to meet their statutory obligations, namely 
the payment of the BIR and PAC and the employees NIS. Also, the banks were unable to meet creditworthiness criteria. And um, also, their debt service ratios, it was difficult for them to meet those ratios. Following the disbursement of the facilities for that, I would call phase one of the um, SME loan guarantee program, we would have reviewed the program and decided that there is something that could be done to boost the uptake for the SMEs. And we would have revisited the challenges and decided that in a phase two of the program, we would seek to address it, thereby reducing the stringent requirements as it were, which inhibited the uptake on the program. I don't know if that would address members' question on the challenges. So let's go to um member who signed then. You're fine then. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So I want to just zero in, in, to, to, in terms of the, the facilities that would be available to these SMEs with respect to the loans um, that would have been processed through the commercial banks. Now, we heard earlier on from Medco that the in order to access the loans, sometimes the business does not even have to be registered when the application has started. Can you confirm the loans from the Ministry of Finance side, whether or not the businesses have to be registered? The program is open to all businesses, not only incorporated businesses, but individuals, partnerships, and the like. So okay. the answer is all the businesses do not have to be registered if you mean incorporated. So no, I'm asking about registered in terms of filing your necessary registration documents with your Registrar General. So for example, a sole trader will still have to register, a partnership will still have to register, a company will have to be incorporated. So is it that you are, according to Netco, even if you are unregistered, you were able to access the loan? I'm asking from the ministry side whether or not the business had to be registered to access the loan. From, from the ministry side, um, the SME loan program has some basic requirements that have been put in place by the banks one way and by the ministry, the government by extension. And the borrower is required to provide a number of warranties in order to qualify. They have to provide the applicable, applicable lender annual audited or management financial statements within 60 days of each fiscal year. They have to provide semi-annual audit, an audited financial statements for the borrower within 60 days of the semi-annual date. And any other financial and operating statements and reports as and when the lender may reasonably require. Those financial covenants are preconditions for accessing the loan. Okay. Um, so am I to take it that in order for the patients to, so after the money is dispersed to the, the borrower, the funds will be released by the bank to the borrower. And therefore there will be some auditing that has to take place and the, the borrower has to account for the money. And if I'm to understand um, that it's a controlled disbursement, so the bank would not give all of the money at the same time, but you have to show the necessity that you need the money. Is that true? Yes, and um, it's not only to show it, there is a monitoring that you use the money for the purpose for which it was given. So on the one hand, Netco is saying that there should be no, there's no accounting for where the money was spent. But on the ministry side, if you're accessing this particular facility, you have to show accounting. Yes, it's, there are two different facilities and on the ministry side, it's clear with respect to our arrangement with the bank, that that is an absolute necessity. And with NETCO, you don't need to provide the statutory obligations in terms of the payment of taxes, but with, res um, but with respect to the ministry, to access that funding, you need to 
meet all the statutory obligations. I don't want to speak for Nepco in that way, um, member, but what I can say is with respect to the SME loan guarantee program, during the phase one period, which is before we would have looked at the challenges, you were required to submit all your statutory obligations up to date. When we realized that the uptake was not optimum, we would have relaxed those requirements, and you would have asked the SMEs to submit their statutory obligations up to the end of 2018, financial year 2018. We, however, put in that they are supposed to bring those obligations up to date within one year, and those obligations would be in respect of 2019 and 2020, within one year of having received the loan. Or, make an arrangement with the authorities, which would be the Board of Inland Revenue and the National Insurance Board, to have the outstanding obligation settled within two years of having received the loan facility. So we would have been stringent in phase one, requesting that your statutory obligations be absolutely up to date. We would have relaxed that to phase two to take into account that the uptake was not as optimum as we would have liked it in terms of the SMEs accessing the facilities. But we do have the requirement to have your statutory obligations up to date embedded in the loan facility. So, Ms. Efren, if so, the first phase, they had to provide financial statements up until I believe it was six years previous to the date of the application. How, how, how far back you had to go? Provide I would I would need to confirm that with the banks because that was not a requirement um, in the documentation with the agreement. The requirement in the documentation speaks to banks applying their normal lending criteria plus whatever we would have put on the side of the government in order to justify the provision of the collateral and the guarantees to these facilities. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Member Lashminia and then Member Ramrat. Hey, um, thank you. Um, I'm specifically getting back to the SME. This is about the SME loan facility as well. Um, I think the, the apart from documentation, the requirements were also relaxed in phase two with respect to the um, amount of revenue that you earned as well as the, um, yeah, I think it was, the, you, there was a movement downward initially. There was something like a $6 million threshold. Uh, what was the original thinking and criteria used um, in order to set that, that, um, that bracket of six to 20 million? And um, then, you know, it's dropped drastically the minimum threshold to something like $500,000. I assume that had to do with the uptake as well, but you could clarify for me and also clarify the, the minimum requirement, minimum employee requirements as well. What was the thinking behind it? What was the, you know, um, what, what really was the rationale for that criteria being set? Well, with respect to the minimum of five employees, um, when this, this SME guarantee program was conceptualized, it was in discussion with the central bank. And we would have had input from the commercial bank and the population and the what the banks would have viewed as SMEs ready to access this particular facility would have informed some of the decisions made with respect to size of SMEs and the threshold, because that information would reside among the banks in respect of their um, customers, so to speak. So that would have informed um, those um, thresholds. However, when the phase one was rolled out and all matters were considered, it was deemed that those thresholds should be shifted to facilitate greater uptake on the facility. Thank you. 
Member Rambarat, please. Right. Thank you very much. Um, there were there were several facilities offered by the Ministry of Finance. Could you say what was the total amount made available to SMEs by the Ministry of Finance via the various facilities, one? And two, could you give us some details on how the allocation to trade unions end up um, being dispersed? Credit unions, sorry. Madam Chairman, at this time we also don't have the answers to those two questions. Would we be able to provide that as well in writing? Very well. We look forward to receiving it at the earliest opportunity. Good. May I know how? Yes. Member Gonzalez, will you proceed, please? Thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, Chair, for the benefit of the listening and perhaps viewing audience. Um, I just want to ask the Ministry of Finance representatives, um, especially following up from member Saddam Hussein's questioning or his line of questioning, where an attempt was being made to compare the administration of the SME loan facility by the Ministry of Finance, as well as the uh, compared to, to that of the entrepreneurial relief grant facility being administered by the ministry by by netco and i don't know if the ministry of finance um being responsible for the administration of finance um, finance in the country can for the benefit of the viewing and the listening audience give an explanation as to the differences or the main difference in the both grants Did we have a response? The, the Entrepreneurial Relief Grant is a grant which was provided. Sorry, is it the NETCO grant or the credit union facility? No, the NETCO grant. So a comparison was being made with respect to the administration of the Entrepreneurial Relief Grant and the S, um, being administered by NETCO and the SME loan facility being administered by the Ministry of Finance. And um, Chair, I don't know if Mr. Calvin Maurice from NETCO can also come in to give some clarity because I myself would need some clarity on that. Thank you, Chair. The NETCO relief grant, as I indicated earlier in our discussion, is one to treat with loss in the business. And from what, from our standpoint, we wanted evidence to show that one, the business existed, two, that the business existed during the period uh, in which COVID, there was an impact in COVID. Its expenditure would have been made based on the ex expectation of business activity during the period where COVID impacted the economy. And in that regard, the loss occurred. And so therefore, NETCO was in more in a way of providing that social support to the entrepreneurs to make sure that they recover and it did not take in consideration the future sustainability in its sense because the loan arrangement, and I would just put it in my way, um, that the Ministry of Finance would have had in the various guarantee programs would have taken the SMEs um, further and in terms of sustainable business. But we wanted to ensure that what loss would have been recovered. So in that, in, so in that see, instant, mm -hmm. in that instant, an examination of their taxes or examination 
of their accounts would not have been our primary focus, simply that the business existed and the evidence of loss would have been identified. So it's just a question of recouping the losses once you can prove them. Exactly so, Chairman, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. I just have one immediate follow-up to this, and it's based on what Mr. Maurice just said. Because I'm looking at Netco's, a document on Netco's website. It's an FAQ on the Entrepreneurial Relief Grant. And I'm quoting from this, and it says that business owners can access up to $20,000 to offset operational expenses, upgrade equipment, purchase inventory, and, finan and finance repairs. So Netco, based on what the information that they put out to the public, they're providing that grant for all of those um, items I just called out. But we have, now we are hearing from Mr. Maurice that it is only to offset losses. So I don't know, Madam Chair, what we should rely on, what Netco put out or the oral evidence that we're receiving um, this morning, because it's quite inconsistent with respect to how this grant and the criteria for the disbursement of this grant. Well, they're here now, so maybe they can clarify it on spot. So, in re as I said, we hold the position in terms of uh, loss in regards to the entrepreneur, um, operational expenses, as again, in terms of, of loss, as relates to equipment. And so, therefore, the, we would provide the further documentation, if required, to explain that element of the uh, requirements as in terms of the, 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 the um, disbursement of the grant. But certainly the primary focus of the, the grant is to recover loss. So that is um, uh, NECO's uh, position in regards to that area. I think what we're looking at is the, you know, <clears throat> accountability, and um, we are, are pleased to hear that relief is being granted, you know, to some people, but we just want to be sure as to the aspect of accountability and if everything is in place to facilitate, because at the end of the day, you're always looking to see the effect of whatever you do on the economy as a whole and um, that everything is done in a proper manner. Mr. Men Member Rambarat, you had a follow-up question or a new question for yes. us? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I, I hope that I'll be a severe, a severe um, shower. You seem to be breaking up, Ms. Men Member. Um, it, it's really the rain might be the sound. Um, there's a suggestion that you can take the video off and see if that will help. Right. Not that we want to lose you, but you know, at least if we can get a voice. Right. Is this is this better? Yeah, much better. Right, thank you. There's a, there's a severe show up taking place now. I just want to go back to my question and, and make the point that. The officers before us didn't give an indication of the total value of the support made available by the Minister of Finance. But when I look at just four pay facilities, it comes up to half a billion dollars, and that's just four pay facilities. And I, I would make a point that it is, not, it is not for lack of support being provided by the Ministry of Finance. The SME support was 268 million, the entrepreneurial support was 30 million, and there were two credit union facilities, and credit union each. But I just want to go back to the credit union question. And I, I, I'm quite surprised that in the 100 million, one of the 100 million facilities made available to the credit unions with the intention of providing support to their 300,000 members who may have suffered loss of income or loss of our business, that from what, what was submitted by the Ministry of Finance, I'm seeing that in 
one instance, one period, only 544,000 was, was dispersed. And in another period, only 126,000 was dispersed. So it means that out of a possible facility of 100 million, the credit unions only accessed less than 1 million. And I wanted to know if the officers who are, who are before us can give us any information on that. What, what accounts for that less than 1% of take of such an important facility? And perhaps in answering the question, <clears throat> if you could indicate, although this is up to December, if you have any indication that things have um, changed to date, because I can just think, even if you talk about one credit union, that that 11 could not be a... Um, a figure, a, a credible figure. So perhaps you could, you know, maybe that first period something happened and then things. So if you can give us that information because it seems incredible, Frank. Thank you, Chair. And uh, I'll to submit that particular response in writing. Without giving us exact figures. We have here 11 loans approved between June to December 2020. I thank you for the offer to submit in writing, but I'm asking you now, from your information, can you see that that figure has moved far away from that 11 initial figure? Just from your own knowledge of, of what is before you now, with all specific numbers being furnished to this committee. Madam Chair, the total number of loans is for the credit union emergency income loan facility is 75. The arrangements for the disbursement of those loans are the credit unions would lend and seek a reimbursement from the Ministry of Finance. The disbursement of the 75 loans are in two different categories as it were, in the sense that 64 of those loans, totaling $544,000, have already been, been reimbursed to the credit union. Subsequent to that reimbursement, it was necessary to put in place some amended agreements to extend that facility to the end of December 2021. And the 11 loans that were subsequently issued were, were subsequent to those 64, and those are yet to be reimbursed. So I think the figure is not 11 in total, it's actually 75. And but you have here June to December 2020, you know. Do you mean June to November 2021? I mean, you know, the same, that figure, I'm, I'm still confused because you're talking about December 2020. That period you just gave us is what period? Where you say you have 70 something now? As at the end of 2020. All right, so we request an, an update um, from your submissions, yes? And we look forward to that. Thank you very much. So, mem Member Gonzalez, followed by Mrs. Scotland. Member Scotland, please. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, Chair, what we have been hearing from the, um, the various state agencies before us, especially Ministry of Finance, um, it shouldn't be lost upon us as a committee that the government has gone out of its way to make hundreds of millions of dollars available to various um, sectors in the society by way of support during a very difficult time um, in this COVID-19 pandemic. 
especially to support small businesses to get out you know, of the difficult situation that they found themselves in. So over half a billion dollars were made available to support these, um, these small businesses. Um, but what is very clear to us is that a number of these businesses, hundreds of them, are operating in somewhat of an informal sector, whereas they are unable to provide management accounts, audited financial statements, etc., to access the hundreds of millions of dollars being made available to them. And it suggests to us as a country that perhaps we need to have a program to bring these small businesses into a more formalized setting so that they can participate and get access to the support and the grants that this government is making available to them. Because it does not make sense that you have hundreds of millions of dollars sitting in the Ministry of Finance, in the banks, etc. By way of support to, the, to this sector, and they are unable to access it so as to move the economy forward and get people employed. So we may have to look at ways in which we can assist those businesses to, to, to get their management accounts um, settled, to, to submit and to have their businesses registered so that they can get access to the support that this government has provided to them. Mr. Maurice, would you assist in responding to that from Netco point of view? Your role in all of this? Madam Chair, thank you. Netco has started the process through the grant disbursement of grant where part of the requirement would have been the registration of the businesses. So at the end of the day, we would have those persons who applied for grants being registered and forming part, being part of the formal system. Other than that, NEDCO will be uh, working together with all stakeholders to engage these small micro businesses who are not registered, who are not part of the system in terms of reaching out to the communities, doing um, various forms of data collection to determine where they are, what sectors are um, impacted by this, this problem. And we will be going out in terms of putting a system in place to um, increase business registration. And since we have the Ministry of Finance here, perhaps they, they, <clears throat> some official can explain what happened with taxpayers' assistance? You know, because you'll be hearing a lot about the taxes and so on. Why was that discontinued? When I asked the question, I was, I was told that the people are clamoring for it. But certainly that was a facility that was widely used. Why was it discontinued? Why isn't it happening now? Thanks, Chair. I will attempt to provide, but it's a question that may require some input from the Board of Inland Revenue. But we have introduced the online tax payment return system, and it was hoped that that would alleviate some of those difficulties that taxpayers would have had. But you know that sometimes the online increases the difficulty and not alleviates the difficulty. You know, so you really need a physical presence there for people to get the assistance, especially people who are trying with a small business. So perhaps you could look at that. Then just transfer it to online where you, you find that people are complaining about a lot of the things that are happening online. You know, they don't have access to computers, some of them. The very people you're trying to target are uh, the very people who cannot access these new things that you put in line with on, you know, that you put in place, which are supposed to assist them. So always think about the, the people you're targeting and what their needs are to, and to see whether in fact you are meeting those needs. Member Hossein. Chairman, you, 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 you forgot me? Member Scotland, I am sure 
member who signed, in spite of what was said earlier, will defer to you, and we will have you now. No, Chiara, I, 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 I thought I'm in your hands. Whatever you once, once you haven't forgotten me, I'm good. I no, can no, you, you can't be in in um. Anyway, I, I, I will be serious here. Yes. Um, <laughs> I am. You, yes, you are in my hands. You are in my hands. I the am. floor is yours. Make use of it. And Thank then you we will go to Member Hussein. Chairman, I am piggybacking both on your suggestion and uh, Member Gonzalez's contribution. And I confirm that I have not spoken to either of you with this question. Chairman, it follows with all the incentives that have been included in this budget, but particularly focusing on such a critical time. What is the Ministry of Finance and NECO, what are they doing to reach communities so that the communities can benefit? Because these are beneficial projects, these are beneficial incentives, Chairman. What are they doing to rural communities, East Port of Spain, San Juan Barataria, which there are several entrepreneurs who exist in those communities. What is being done to reach out? Because some of them, Madam Chair, don't listen to this program. They don't listen to the budget. What, are, what is being done to tell them there's a tax holiday for the first five years after you list on the, on, on, on the stock exchange? Or what is being done to reach those communities? and the persons who live in those communities so that they can access the benefits of these pro projects. And my second question is, as it relates, Madam Chair, to the um, economic activities, what measures are being taken to stimulate economic activities amongst the SME sector during this period and post-COVID? Those are my two questions, Chair. Mr. Maurice? Thank you very much. Are to go? <laughs> thank you very much, very Madam much Chair. Chair. So I thank the committee for that question because just a matter of about two weeks ago, we started, well, we continued in that vein in terms of having the micro-entrepreneurs truly understand the budget and what they can access with the budget. In the first instant, we used the digital platform in terms of a webinar, and we used that in, in, in concert with TIC um, that NETCO was a major part of in explaining to the micro-entrepreneurs what the budget will mean for them and how NETCO and other agencies can support them deliver their dream to sustain their businesses. But I also know the committee may say, well, that's a webinar, that's digital. How do you reach down in the community? 2022 will be a focus in terms of going out in the community, looking at different forms, whether we can engage the community with mics, to engage the community in terms that is relative to community and village life that they will understand. And this is a major, major, major area that NECO is going to involve in. In terms of the quantity of loan these micro-entrepreneurs could, could, could access, whether it's 20,000, whether it's 25,000, NECO is also revisiting the aspect of collateral because one will say and know that at this time, small entrepreneurs, persons in the villages, persons in the rural areas will not have collateral, the type of collateral. Now, we also protecting the interest of uh, the risk and that has to be balanced in a serious way in terms of NETCO's mandate, in terms of the loan arrangement. But certainly, I want to really compliment the committee in picking up on that vital, vital point in terms of reaching out to the community and 
taking the bottom-up approach in terms of entrepreneurial development. So in the next 12 months, less now, 11, I say, NECO will be looking in our physical, physical activities for 2022 to reach and to give smaller loans, look at our collateral arrangements to bring in the sector in. And also, one of our mandates in doing that will be to register these small businesses. So to access loans, these small businesses will be required to register their businesses. So there'll be an entire process in terms of engaging and developing these micro entrepreneurs. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. You know, you had me wondering if you were sitting in the right chair there, you know, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't say more. I wouldn't say more, but maybe there, anyway, Chairman, let's, leave Chairman, it, let's leave it there. Chairman, be, be, be before you, be before you relieve um, Netco, can I pin him down to a specific time when he can say that we are starting from Beverly Hills because I will make myself available when they're reaching out to the community. I'm specifically speaking about the constituents which I have had the distinction um, to represent because I would want to be part of that chairman. I'm available from January the 2nd. Madam Chair, oh, through your, your, your good office. Any member can approach member um, NETCO, any community group can approach NETCO to uh, get our support. We need their support, as a matter of fact, in reaching out in the community. So we need you more, I would say, to help us get into the community and to support the community. As I also said, there is a balance that must happen in terms of the loan. It's not a grant. The lo giving loans to the communities there must be a balance as, and we are looking at it in terms of the collateral arrangement and the relationship with the community groups and whoever gets involved in NETCO to give that assurance in terms of persons repaying their loans and um, making their commitment in terms of sustainable um, sustainability, not only for them, but for NETCO as well. Thank oh, you, Madam right. Chair. I'm sure you're going to be going to those community centers, you know, and speaking to the community and you'll be going around with your microphones and so on. So as you leave here over the, we're giving you a, we have no meeting in, in um, December and you will be setting out your program of activities and um, proceeding on them. So when we meet again, either virtually, as some of you like to meet virtually or otherwise, we will have everything down on paper with the timelines and we say yes this is what they have done this is what they have done so and madam chair some of your members may even say yes we worked with netco in having that done in the communities but of course mr maurice I am and so involved. we move now um mr member hosein and then member gonzalez yes Thank you. Member Hussain, are you hearing? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just have, uh, Madam Chair, I, just, I would have to be relieved a bit earlier as I have a religious obligation on a Friday. So after these two questions, I will finish um, for the day in terms of questioning. Yes, um, we will all finish. We will all finish very, very soon. We, we, we are at the end of it. We just have five minutes and we're closing off. Um, it goes back to the question of Forex, because I said I would have asked the Ministry of Finance earlier on. Um, there's a percentage of Forex that will be available to the Exim Bank for, as we heard before, manufacturing and for the acquisition of um, goods and um, supplies in relation to COVID, um, medical supplies, um, food items. Can you give us an indication of what is the percentage of Forex that is allocated to commercial banks as compared to the Exim Bank in terms of a percentage, because we still have a complaint from a lot of businesses who may not be involved in manufacturing, um, that they are having a lot of difficulty in accessing Forex um, from the commercial banks that has led to some of them having to close their doors um, be, uh, during this pandemic. That's the first question. And the second question is for Netco. Um, a member of the public reached out to me and just asked, 
um, can you just give an average timeline um, for how long it takes to process one of the entrepreneur relief grants? And those are the two very short and succinct questions. And the response, so that um, I don't want you to be late, you know, Ms. Sosa, and so you can even, you know, li listen to it off premises. So, if, you, uh, if you have to I leave. Think, I wish you be relieved. Thank you very much. Yes. Until the next time. Madam Chair's response is going to be based on order presented. If not, then I would indicate uh, in regards to Ned Coe's question. Initially, it would, would have taken a longer period, I would say as much as a two months period in terms of processing of the entrepreneurial grant, given the novelty in terms of how it was processed through an online arrangement and the difficult in terms of the initi initiative being new, um, it took some time um, and I, the grants, the processing of the grants took a longer period. Uh, at this time, and as we finished the 30 million, um, it would have been a shorter period. Within um, three weeks, the grant would have been um, processed. So therefore, one example uh, one would give, NEDCO, in total, we had a total of over 5,000 um, applications. At the end of the disbursement of the uh, 30 million, we uh, disbursed 3,500. So uh, the, that is a good indicator in terms of uh, the disbursement uh, that existed, in terms of the speed of the disbursement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question from the public. Does NETCO have any system in place to assist and guide SMEs through the tax, VAT, and other state registration processes? And if it does not, will this be put in place? Madam Chair, we do, as we spoke about the business advisory program, they can call into NETCO and NETCO, uh, our staff, our officers, will guide them through the various areas. And not only in terms of the statutory requirements, but other areas of business advisory as well. Thank you. Next question, does NETCO provide free training for SME in financial management, tax filing, tendering for state contracts, etc.? Of course, Madam oh, Chairman. However, it, it's a mixed arrangement. It's a mixed arrangement. Some would be via free webinars and others would be low cost training that the uh, client will be required to, to pay to access some of these training. And I want to emphasize low cost in terms of the fee to access that training. Low cost as opposed to free. There's low cost and there's free. You have both. I yes. See. So we have free webinars and we have low cost training. Yes. All right. So your motto could really be for your organization. We aim to please. Exactly so, Madam Chair. Exactly so. Any further questions or have we exhausted them all? I, I we, we, all we could provide is a virtual lunch, I'm afraid. So we can perhaps move now into final comments. Brief closing comments from the chief officials of the various departments. Brief, brief. So we, perhaps we can, end in the opposite order which we began began so let's have the ministry of finance first then trade sorry um, madam chair i'm just following up one question before we end i think miss member hussein before he left he had two questions one was a forex question i heard i didn't um hear the answer to that question Ministry of Finance. 
Thank you, Chair. The question I was with respect to the commercial bank, for it, that is made available to them from the central bank, and that is done periodically, but the precise uh, amount or percentage we will have to provide again in writing. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, um, Ms. Member Muslach Media. So we have. Yeah, before um, so Alexander, sorry. Sorry, Chair. I I do apologize. I did not raise my hand, but just to um provide some clarity um, as a member of the cabinet, where the whole arrangement with the Exim Bank is concerned for for the benefit of the viewing and listening public. Th this facility, Madam Chair, was put in place by the government of Trinidad and Tobago to help ease the forex um situation in the country. But it is geared towards assisting those companies that are net owners of foreign exchange in Trinidad and Tobago. For example, those companies that require raw materials, equipment, etc., and um, in order to boost their trade and earn foreign exchange in the country. So that those uh, businesses or clients who may have challenges in accessing um, um, forex, um, in going through the limitations and going through the requirements through the Exim Bank, one of the things that they will have to satisfy is that they are net owners of foreign exchange. And if they are not next net owners of foreign exchange, then they will always have that difficulty in accessing it because the Exim Bank facility is to ensure that those companies and those traders that are net owners of foreign exchange, that they get access to the necessary foreign exchange in order to boost economic activity in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much. Can we proceed to the closing remarks? Ministry of Finance. Mrs. Nimetoran. Thank you, Chairman. On behalf of the team, we are pleased to be here, and I know we have committed to provide our responses, some of our responses in writing. We commit to do so, and we also uh, commit to taking necessary action that will come out of your recommendations as necessary. Thank you. Mr. Alexander, please. Ministry of Trade and Industry. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thanks for the committee for allowing us to uh, address uh, the matter uh, of SMEs and, and the issues being taken um, to, to help and support. Um, Chair, in closing, I would just like to encourage the listening public to um, approach the Ministry of Trade and Export TT um, for uh, more information on the types of support and uh, uh, programs that are available. Um, they can also contact the Trinidad and Tobago Coalition of Services Industries who would um, provide support and assistance to service um, providers as well. And just to also indicate for um, those in Tobago, Export TT, um, do have officers um, stationed there that they can approach as well, um, who would also give more information on all the programs that are available. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Hussain, Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, I, as we close, I must ab apologize that uh, during the course of the meeting, Due to technical difficulties, I lost connectivity for a brief period. Nevertheless, I hope that the information provided by the ministry and by NEDCO um, was useful in your deliberations. And I thank you for the opportunity to appear before the committee and we do look forward to your recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. 
all of you who appeared before us today, we thank you for your participation and for the enlightenment you brought to the several questions that we engage you with. And we also thank the members of the public for their questions. And we hope that we have brought clarity to a lot of the questions. And we are looking forward to the promises that we had been fulfilled to send us things in writing. We thank the committee members who participated remotely in this virtual hearing. Let's see what we'll get next year. And, you know, we have a break until January, as I said before. And I must thank the staff of the Office of the Parliament for their procedural and logistical support. The viewing and listening audience, thank you for being with us. This is our last public meeting for 2021. And it behoves me to bring greetings. But before I do, I would wish to let you remember, I wish to remind you to follow all of the protocols because you know that we are here and discussing this topic because Mr. COVID-19 has brought us here. So we have a responsibility and we must take that personal responsibility so that we can rebuild the economy, regain civil liberty. So let's work together by following the protocols for COVID to go away so we can all live to see another day. So Merry Christmas, all of you. See you all in 2022. Same to you, Chair. Merry Christmas to you and a bright and prosperous 2022 and the same go towards, um, or rather for all members of the committee and the participants um, in this meeting. This meeting is adjourned. Be safe, everyone. <laughs>